Uh, so really excited to have uh, Conrad Miller present uh, Wood Eliminating Racial Disparities in Motor Vehicle Searches, Post Efficiency Costs. And you're, I think you're the last Berkeley talk of the day. So. <laughs> last Berkeley, last uh, policing talk too. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, thanks for including me on this great program. And I think it, it is helpful to go last after these other policing papers because I think they provide a, a lot of helpful context and motivation uh, for what we're doing here. So just to, some, some more specific context for, for what we're looking at. Um, turns out that among motorists stopped for traffic violations, police are more than twice as likely to stop or to search Black and Hispanic motorists. And these disparities invite allegations that police engage in racial profiling. And by that, we just mean using race as one factor when deciding whether to search someone. Now, of course, profiling is a controversial practice and it's, it's controversial in part because it may impose an equity efficiency trade-off. So on the equity side, perceived profiling undermines trust in police. Profiling likely contributes to racial disparities in arrests and, and exposure to police use of force as well. On the other hand, profiling can potentially make policing more efficient if in fact race predicts who is likely to have contraband. Whether there is in fact this equity efficiency trade-off is, is actually in dispute. And the answer is important for a few reasons. Uh, in part, it's, it's relevant because some argue that the legality of racial disparities in search depends on, on the existence of this trade-off. To understand why this is in dispute, uh, note that there are at least two interpretations of the following piece of evidence. So a useful concept here is uh, the hit rate. So Jonah thankfully introduced this idea, but in our context, when we're talking about searches, the hit rate here is going to be the percentage of searches that yield contraband. And across studies, the hit rate for white motorists is typically equal to or, or greater than the hit rate among Black and Hispanic motorists. So in other words, the average search of Black and Hispanic motorists is no more likely to yield contraband than the average search of white motorists. Now, one common interpretation of this fact is that it indicates search disparities can't be justified on efficiency grounds. And in particular, under this interpretation, you know, the evidence suggests we could equalize search rates across groups without reducing the amount of contraband recovered. Now, on the other hand, economists have pointed out that to know whether police are on the efficient frontier, we need to know whether search productivity at the margin is equalized across groups. So this first interpretation of the data you know, could be consistent. Um, the first interpretation is consistent with the data, but it's, it's implicitly assuming that marginal search motorists are as likely to carry contraband as inframarginal search motorists. And of course, that, that need not be the case. So we can imagine another extreme example where marginal and inframarginal search motorists are quite different. So suppose that uh, all motorists searched today have some chance of carrying contraband while all motorists that are not searched today actually have zero chance of carrying contraband. So in that case, if we were to equalize search rates and trade off, say, searches of, of Hispanic and white motors with searches of, of uh, Hispanic and black motors with uh, searches of white motors, that would necessarily reduce contraband yield in that extreme. And the problem with distinguishing between these, these cases is that typically we can only measure the average productivity of searches and average and marginal productivity um, may differ when they're, in particular, when they're declining returns to search. And this is the well-known inframarginality problem that's come up a couple of times. So our research question in this paper is, does this trade-off exist? And in particular, what we mean by that is, would equalizing search rates across racial groups of motorists decrease overall contraband yield? And one thing I want to note here, particularly after Jonah's talk, is that this is this is a pretty reduced form question we're, we're asking here in the sense that we're not actually trying to identify bias per se. We're not trying to identify whether a particular officer is biased or whether officers overall are biased on average. We're just interested in what would happen in this, this counterfactual where we equalize search rates. So it's related to this bias question, but it's, it's not quite as interested in the fundamentals there. We're gonna answer this question using unique administrative data on Texas highway patrol stops. 
And we're going to use a simple framework to show that the answer to our research question depends on what we call the search productivity curve, or SPC. And that's the relationship between search rates and the percentage of stops that yield contraband. The latter is what we're going to refer to as the unconditional hit rate, just as, as Jonah uh, uh, defined it. So what we're going to do is we're going to use variation in search behavior across troopers to estimate motorist race, race specific search productivity curves. And we're going to refer to these as between trooper SPCs. So in other words, what we're doing is to understand what contraband yield would look like if troopers searched Black and Hispanic motorists less often. We're going to look at the contraband yield for the subset of troopers that search Black and Hispanic motorists less often uh, than average. Then we're going to use the, the SPCs we estimate to simulate contraband yield under two counterfactuals. And in both cases, the, the aim here is to reduce racial disparities in search and see what happens for contraband yield. First, we're going to ask what would happen if we reallocated troopers across patrol areas so that high search propensity uh, troopers are put in low minority share areas. And then second, we're going to ask what would happen if we required troopers to equalize their search rates across motorist racial groups. There are going to be several issues that come up in constructing both of these counterfactuals, and hopefully if I'll, I'll leave time for that uh, at the end. OK, just to, to preview what we find, though, um, first, just descriptively, we find that conditional on the location and time of the stop in our data, Black and Hispanic motorists are about 160% and 70% more likely to be searched than white motorists. Black and white motorists uh, have similar hit rates, uh, while the Hispanic hit rate is, is lower. And these findings are, are consistent with prior research in this area. Second, we're going to estimate variation in trooper search behavior using multiple research designs that I'll get into. And across these multiple approaches, our aim is to identify how would the outcomes of equivalent cases vary with the, the search rate for the trooper that's conducting that stop. Uh, and what we find is that the search productivity curve is approximately linear. So in other words, troopers that search twice as often find contraband twice, uh, find twice, twice as much contraband. And under conditions that I'll uh, discuss and test, this is going to imply that average and marginal hit rates are approximately equal, and that there, in fact, is no inframarginality problem in our context. And so this means that of those two interpretations of the data I gave you, the first one is actually more correct. So what does that mean? That means, you know, in our counterfactuals, uh, what we're going to find is that it's feasible for troopers to actually equalize search rates across motorist racial groups maintain the overall search rate, all the while uh, increasing overall contraband yield. So in other words, there's no efficiency cost to equalizing search rates uh, across racial groups. And another implication of our, our finding that I think is, is perhaps interesting here, uh, particularly given the discussion earlier today about um, you know, how police are, may learn um, you know, one implication of our findings is that troopers appear actually to be quite limited in their ability to discern between motorists that are more or less likely to yield contraband. And that's really following directly from this, the, the fact that we're finding this relationship between search rates and unconditional hit rates is approximately linear. Okay, um, so Jonah did a nice job of kind of motivating the most uh, uh, kind of important papers in this space. Um, let me just describe what we're doing a little bit relative to this existing literature. So there, there are several important papers here that are that are essentially trying to test for racial bias using the logic of the um, Becker outcome test in the context of policing or, or criminal justice more broadly. Uh, these papers get around the inframarginality problem either by making modeling assumptions, as in uh, Knowles, Persico, and Todd, or by focusing on relative discrimination between groups of decision makers rather than absolute bias, as in, uh, for example, Anwar and Fang, you know, or as in uh, these important recent papers, Arnold Doby and Yang and Arnold Doby Hull, uh, those papers estimate marginal returns directly, so confronting this inframarginality problem directly, 
Um, but doing that requires placing some restrictions on, on heterogeneity across decision makers. Uh, a, a key distinction between what we're doing in this previous literature is that, as I said, we're interested in this equity efficiency trade-off, um, but we're not actually trying to identify whether troopers are biased per se. And this distinction is actually going to turn out to matter. So in particular, if you actually apply the tests in Knowles, Persico and Todd, and Warren Fang, or Arnold, Dobie, and Yang in our context, you would conclude that there's no evidence of racial, of anti-Black bias in our data. Uh, and that's essentially because we've got linearity plus similar hit rates for white and black motorists. Yet we'll still find that there's there's no equity efficiency trade-off in the sense that there's no efficiency cost equalizing black and white search rates. Um, so we're in this world where even if there's no kind of direct, there's no evidence of, of, of bias here that does not mean that the racial disparities in search rates we see are a necessary consequence of, of efficient policing. Um, one other thing I want to point out here is that, you know, points points been made in this literature that police may focus on arrest maximization as their objective, which in our context is going to translate to contraband yield. But arguably, the more relevant social goal is is crime minimization, and those two goals can be in conflict. Um, we're going to focus on contraband yield in this paper, as as does much of the literature, but we're also going to provide, at least in the paper, there's suggestive evidence uh, that deterrence effects are quite limited in our setting, and so. These two objectives actually aren't that different uh, in practice. And that, that's, that's in our setting. Uh, so just an outline of the rest of what I'm going to say. I'll give you more about the context and data. I'll talk, you, talk to you about the, our conceptual framework and the search productivity curve. Then I'll go through our, our research designs for estimating this SPC and, and the, the estimates we get. And then finally, I'll, I'll talk about how we construct counterfactuals. Uh, so first, some context. So we're going to be looking at traffic stops conducted by the Texas State Highway Patrol. Particularly, we're going to focus on stops conducted on state and, and interstate highways. And the way you should be thinking about this is the troopers are going to make stops based on some violation. That's going to include moving violations like speeding, as well as more uh, like equipment and regulatory violations like having expired license plate tags or, or, um, or, or things like that. And in some rare cases, troopers are going to make stops to actually execute arrest warrants. What we're going to focus on here are speeding violations, which are going to account for the majority of stops. And we're going to focus on these in part because these are stops that are more likely to be motivated by the violation itself rather than a desire to investigate the motorist for other violations. This is going to be relevant because we're going to be making the argument that once we condition on the right things, in particular time and location of the stop, the different troopers are actually stopping similar motorists. And I'll show you I'll show you evidence for that, but we think that's particularly um, likely in the, the case of, of speeding stops. Now, after conducting the stop, the trooper is going to decide whether to search the motorists and the vehicle for, for contraband, where contraband here is going to include drugs, weapons, or, or other paraphernalia. Uh, and the trooper can search for various reasons. The, the, by far the most common reasons here are going to be Motorist consent searches where the trooper actually gets the, the verbal consent of the motorist uh, and probable cause searches where um, uh, the trooper declares they have probable cause to conduct the search. That's going to account for, for the vast majority of our searches. An important thing to keep in mind here is that troopers are going to have a lot of discretion over whether they pursue a, a search, uh, in particular in deciding what constitutes probable cause. And so this, this discretion uh, is going to generate significant variation in how different troopers treat equivalent stops. OK, so the data we have here um, cover about 16 million vehicle stops conducted by the Texas State Highway Patrol between 2009 and 2015. We obtain these data from the, the Stanford Open Policing Project, which is a great resource for, for this kind of work. And these data include all stops, importantly, not just those that lead to a citation. So you could be stopped for speeding and then let off with a warning. You should, in principle, still end up in our data. Uh, the data include a lot of information, uh, including information on the context of the stop, so the, the exact time and location, vehicle characteristics, motorist race and gender, uh, as well as the outcome of the stop, including whether there was a search conducted and, and whether it yielded contraband. 
And usefully for us, each stop is going to be associated with a trooper ID. And one reason we focus on Texas is that it has this unique feature, relatively unique feature, where it includes motorists' full name and address in the data. And we're going to do that, we're going to use that to do a couple things. So for one, we're going to use it to match multiple traffic stops of the same motorists. And we're also going to be able to merge in criminal history data, which we collected for a previous project. Um, and finally, we're going to use that to construct income proxies uh, for, for motorists based on their address. With those data, we're, we're going to merge in data from the Texas Computerized Criminal History System, which um, we can use to, to measure arrest, to, to measure criminal history. We can also use it to identify whether a stop leads to an arrest or charge, because we'll identify uh, whether an arrest you know, coincides with a, with a given stop, just based on the timing and, and context. Uh, and finally, we use um, commercial address history data to account for people that are moving across places. Okay, some additional sample restrictions we make here that are useful to keep in mind. I've, I've mentioned these already. We're restricting to, to speeding stops made on highways. We're going to focus on Black, Hispanic, and white motorists because uh, those groups are going to account for um, nearly all the stops in our data. We're going to focus on people with Texas addresses uh, because... Um, that's where we're going to be able to get criminal history. So this leaves us with about 5 million stops. Uh, and just some, some context here. Uh, these are the search and hit rates uh, in our sample of, of stops. So motors are searching a little over 1% of speeding stops. The hit rate is about 31%, meaning in 31% of searches, troopers find some contraband. Uh, black motorists are about three times more likely to be searched than white motorists, and Hispanic motorists are about 60% more likely to be searched. Uh, the hit rate for black motorists is slightly lower than the hit rate for white motorists, while the hit rate for Hispanic motorists is, is going to be markedly lower than both, and that's, that's consistent with past literature. Um, another kind of useful thing we can do with our data is we can ask, oh, how much do other motorist characteristics explain these disparities? Um, just in a statistical sense. So we find that controlling for income and criminal history could explain you know, 35 to 50% of racial disparities in search, yet actually explains very little of racial disparities in, in hit rates. And kind of to put the magnitude of the black-white disparity in context, you can note that the differential in search rates for black motorists is about half the increase associated with the prior drug arrest. Um, one important thing to note here is, you know, those are conditional statistics on, you know, what happens if we control for stuff. For everything I'm going to do for the rest of the talk, I'm just going to be thinking about unconditional disparities, so not conditioning on other uh, motorist characteristics like, you know, criminal history, which is itself, uh, you know, endogenous here. Um, and finally, we're going to focus on contraband as our outcome of interest, so just an indicator for whether they find uh, the trooper finds contraband. Um, we also find that conditional on finding contraband, the severity of the offense is similar by race as measured by arrest rates and the uh, severity of the charge. And we could do the same analysis using those alternative outcomes and we would reach similar conclusions. So, I mean, this may be just kind of off topic, but do, do you know why the Hispanic rate is so much dramatically lower? The hit rate? Yeah. Uh, I have not seen... I actually haven't seen much speculation on that, nor have I seen any evidence for a particular mechanism. I think, if I recall correctly, I think consent searches are more frequent for Hispanic motorists. So one, just like completely off the top conjecture is that, you know, it could be that Hispanic motors are actually less resistant to these consent searches. They're more likely to consent to them um, for whatever reason. Uh, you know, uh, you could come up with stories, I think. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't think there's a great explanation for that. I mean, it could just be, it, one explanation is just bias. Um, that's particularly strong for Hispanic motors. Okay. So, um, so what we want to know, though, uh, yeah, question here, Andrew. 
I was just running, wondering real quick on the Hispanic hit rate question. How confident are you in their coding of a Hispanic motorist? Yeah, it's a good question. It turns out to be that turns out to be an important issue. Mm-hmm. There's actually some uh, there was some dust up in Texas, in particular, where it was claimed that uh, troopers were coding motorists as Hispanic in a way that that was perhaps trying to elude detection of racial disparities in search rates. So basically, if they search someone, they'd code someone that was likely Hispanic as white. Mm-hmm. Um, so what we do, in part because we have the, the data on, on names, okay. uh, we just, we use last name and, and actually reclassify everyone as Hispanic based on oh. census data on last names. Um, and that turns out to match up pretty well with what you would code up from uh, people with criminal histories where you might worry about measurement there as well, but uh, anyway, what we're using here is is last name, and so if, if in the census something like seventy five percent of people with your last name self identify as Hispanic, we're going to identify you as Hispanic here. Cool. Thank you. Um, out of curiosity, do you find evidence for what um, you just said about Texas? Like, do you do you have the access to the police categorization as well? Yes, and um, there's a paper about this misclassification. Uh, our last name is, is L-U-H, I think Elizabeth Liu, uh, who I think is at maybe University of Houston, who has a nice paper, basically using that as an alternative measure of bias is this like strategic misclassification of, of motorists. Um, so we don't look at that directly, but she, she does. Um, okay, so Stepping back here, you know, okay, so we're, we're interested in in um, what the overall hit rate would look like if troopers search all racial groups of motorists at the same rate. Uh, to answer this question, we're gonna we're gonna estimate what we call the search productivity curve or, or SPC, and this is the relationship between how often a trooper searches motorists, that's their search rate on the horizontal axis here, and how much contraband they find per stop. It's the the unconditional hit rate, which is on the vertical axis. So this figure summarizing how often troopers find contraband at a given search rate. This is exactly the, the kind of relationship that Jonah was, was interested in in his uh, discussion. Uh, and this is what we're going to try and estimate in the data. So for a given search rate, this figure is going to give you the average and marginal hit rates. Okay, so suppose we searched at this rate um, and we get the average uh, hit rate from the slope of this line, whereas um, you would get the marginal hit rate from the from the dotted blue line here. Um, in this example, the, the SPC is concave, so troopers face diminishing returns to search. The more a trooper searches, the less kind of suspicious the motorists they search are at the margin. You can think of it that way. Um, you know, in another example, we can think of that's actually kind of more consistent with the data. The SPC is is linear, at least up to where search is actually happening. So this is conduct. This is this would be consistent with troopers conducting really only a coarse screening of motorists, where among the most suspicious motorists, troopers can't really discern who is more or less likely uh, to carry contraband. So here, the average and marginal are, are equal. Um, and we can think about you know okay, in this circumstance, um, actually equalizing marginal hit rates across groups is no longer going to uh, kind of imply that there's an equity efficiency trade-off. So in this example, we've got black and white motorists. They're on the same SPC. Black motorists are searched at higher rates than white motorists. But clearly, you know, we could equalize search rates. They're both on the same SPC. We could equalize search rates and get the same overall contraband yield. So even though this would kind of pass at the Becker outcome test, there's still there's still no kind of equity just uh, efficiency justification for the for this disparity in search rates. Okay, um, so most of what this paper is about is trying to estimate this search productivity curve. Um, and ideally, we'd be able to estimate each trooper's SPC individually. Unfortunately, we're not gonna have enough data per trooper uh, or really an appropriate research design to do this. So instead, our approach, our main approach is gonna be to estimate what we call this between trooper SPC. And the, the idea is to look at how different troopers treat similar stops where troopers are gonna vary how often uh, and, ver- and how often they search. 
we're going to use this variation across troopers and search behavior to measure the relationship between unconditional hit rates and, and search rates at the trooper level. Uh, a couple things to note here. So this between trooper SPC is going to be equal to each individual trooper's SPC if the SPC is, is identical across troopers. And this would follow from, from you know, uh, the monotonicity uh, condition of Arnold, Doby, and Yang. Um, a kind of weaker condition we might like here is one where the between trooper SPC is equal to the within trooper SPC averaged across troopers. And that's going to be true under what we call the search, uh, the skill search propensity independence condition. And this allows that troopers can vary in their, their SPCs and particularly can vary in kind of how skilled they are in discerning who's carrying contraband. But it assumes that the screening ability is independent of a, of a trooper's propensity to search. And at the end, I'll talk about some empirical support for this, for this condition that's going to be helpful for constructing uh, the second counterfactual in particular. So our goal here is to measure how different troopers treat equivalent stops. Uh, the problem with implementing this in practice is that troopers are, are not randomly assigned uh, to motorists. So this is this is trickier than the, the bail uh, setting where you do actually, in principle, have you know quasi-random assignment of judges to cases. Um, we're going to try and approximate randomization in a, in a few different ways. At, at baseline, we're just going to make a simple selection on observables like argument. And that's that conditional on the location and time of a stop, the identity of the trooper that pulls over a speeding motorist is as good as random. And we think this is plausible because you've got week to week variation in shift schedules in terms of who's working a given day. And even within a shift, you know, where uh, the trooper that's gonna stop you is gonna depend on, you know, which trooper happens to be relatively close to you at that point in time. Um, so we're gonna, we're, I'll show you evidence consistent with this selection on observables assumption, we think uh, to our first approximation, this, this is actually pretty reasonable. Um, but fortunately, because of some of the nice features of our data, we're gonna be able to corroborate our findings using approaches with alternative identifying assumptions. So in one design, we're gonna look at the same motorists that stop multiple times and essentially estimate models with motorist fixed effects. And in another design, we're gonna exploit uh, patrol area borders in a spatial regression um, RD design. Uh, so the idea there would be, you know, on one side of the border, there's a different set of troopers conducting stops than another side of the border. You're driving along the highway and you transition from one sergeant area, one patrol area to the next, you're going to get this a pretty big shift in the, the set of, of troopers uh, that are stopping you and potentially a pretty big difference in the, the search rates for those troopers. We're going to find pretty similar um, findings across approaches, consistent findings at least. Okay, so uh, for our baseline uh, approach here, the selection on observables approach, the notion of location we're going to use here is what's called a, a sergeant area. And that's depicted here in, in these maps. These, these define the areas that a, a highway trooper is going to patrol. Okay, so they're about 100, they're 160 uh, sergeant areas statewide. Most cover one to two counties in their entirety, uh, while in the most populous counties, you're typically going to have multiple sergeant areas. And the way you should think about these sergeant areas is that you know when a trooper is assigned to a given sergeant area, they're, they're going to be making stops in that area. For our analysis here, we're going to limit to uh, combinations um, of trooper and location uh, with at least 100 stops. And we're going to reweight the data so all troopers have the same time distribution within location, where we define time categories by quarter of day and, and, and weekend versus weekday. And we're going to limit to 139 sergeant areas of these 160 that have at least 10, uh, 10 troopers meeting these uh, criteria. So we're left with about 3,000 trooper location combinations with an average of more than 1,000 stops uh, per combination. Okay, so we're going to denote location-specific trooper search rates by, by um, S sub PL here. P is for, for police or trooper. L is for location. And this is just plotting the distribution of location specific trooper search rates. You see there's substantial variation here with the long right tail. The median search rate is about 0.7%, well, with the 90th 90 percentile is about 3.5%. Um, now, one kind of clear concern with, with these search rates is that they may pick up variation not just in, in search behavior, but also variation in the composition of, of motorists that are stopped. And this variation can 
uh, come about both because uh, you know location and time measures that we're using are not sufficiently granular, or it could be that even in the same environment, troopers are going to vary in the motorists they decide to stop. One way to address this is just to try and control for as much stuff as you can and see how that affects the results. So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate adjusted search rates where we try to account for our motorist characteristics that we can observe, including race, gender, income, criminal history. We can also control for more granular locations. So we can look at the specific highway that you're stopped on within a sergeant area. And then we can control for like the, the timing of the stop. We're going to denote these adjusted measures by, uh, by tildes here. So S sub PL, the tilde, that's the adjusted search rates. And then I forgot to mention the H here is for unconditional hit rate. We can have the adjusted equivalent for that as well. Um, in practice, these adjustments actually make little difference. You can see this, this is a plot of unadjusted search rates against adjusted search rates after netting out location fixed effects. And the correlation is near near perfect here. So, uh, and, and consistent with that, our results are gonna be virtually identical if we use either the adjusted or unadjusted measure. Uh, and another, another way to kind of capture that finding is that consistent with our selection on observables assumption, conditional on the stop location and time, troopers with high and low search rates are stopping observably similar motorists, which is reassuring for us. So one way to see this is in this figure is look at the predicted um, search rates for stopped motorists based on motorist observable characteristics and see how that relates to the search rate for the, the troopers that are stopping them. Okay, so we've got on the horizontal axis trooper search rates on the vertical axis, um, we've got this index for predicted search rate based on motorist characteristics. Uh, and then we've got these dotted lines here for the 90th and 10th percentile of that predicted search rate. And as you can see here, there's very little relationship between um, trooper search rates and the, the types of motorists that they stop as indexed here. We've got, and we've got more evidence of, on that in the paper. Okay, so um, we can construct these trooper by location search rates and unconditional hit rates. And we're gonna use that to just to plot out this between trooper SPC. One last challenge I'll mention here is that um, in principle, these rates are only comparable across troopers within a location, because uh, that's the sense in which we're saying, uh, okay, compare different troopers within the same location, how, do their, how does their behavior change? So in order to construct this between trooper SPC, we wanna aggregate across locations and see how our choices for how we aggregate may affect things. Um, for what I'm gonna show you here, we're gonna take what we call a, a quantile approach. And all we're doing here is we're saying, within a location, we're gonna divide troopers into quantiles uh, by search rate. And then we're gonna group quantiles across locations. Then we're gonna plot the relationship between search rates and unconditional hit rates across quantiles. Uh, and then something we do in the paper is we, we estimate a model um, where we, we net out location fixed effects. Um, and then plot the SBC after netting that out. And we get pretty similar findings. Okay, so here's um, kind of our first finding to show you here. Here's what the between trooper SBC looks like. When we're pooling all motorist racial groups together. Um, the dashed line here is the local linear fit for, uh, uh, sorry, the, the, gray, the gray dots here are just kind of simple bin scatter. And then we've got um, a local linear fit for that bin scatter. Uh, the red dots here and the solid, sorry, the red dots here and the red solid line here, um, that corresponds to this quantile fit where we've divided uh, troopers into these, these deciles. Um, the red line here is the best linear fit there. So there are two things to note. First, we get pretty similar SPC estimates using either approach. So these are the estimated slopes. Um, and the other thing is these, these SPCs are, are, are look quite linear, quite linear um, in either case. So we get a slope of about 33% uh, um, in the just raw bin scatter approach. Uh, in the quantile approach, we get something similar. And this corresponds roughly to our overall search rate of, of 31%. Okay, so aggregation uh, approach doesn't seem to matter much and linearity, those are the kind of the two clear takeaways here. Um, we can do the same thing and now construct race specific uh, uh, SPCs. Here we're going to limit the number of, of sergeant areas a little bit more because we want to look in areas where there's enough 
stops of black, Hispanic, and white motorists. Um, but here's what you get with those restrictions. Um, so here's the between trooper SPC for, for white motorists. You get a larger slope than the kind of the pooled slope, which is consistent with the fact that the hit rate for white motorists was larger than the hit rate for, for all motorists. But again, quite linear. Similar patterns for black motorists, but with lower hit rates. And again, similar pattern for Hispanic motorists with an even lower, um, even lower hit rate. Okay, so given linearity, you know that you you would kind of expect uh, to get the same ordering of, of slopes here that we just see in overall hit rates. Uh, so the, a key remaining concern here is that troopers with different surge rates are stopping motorists with different unobservable characteristics. Um, as I mentioned, there's we, we do a bunch of uh, robustness checks apply other research designs. So, you know, one thing to note is we get the same results with and without adjustments for these other uh, stop and motorist covariates. Um, we can also remove different sets of troopers that seem to be selecting their motorists in, in the most unusual ways. It doesn't really change our results at all. Uh, and then we have these other alternative research designs that require alternative identifying assumptions. So we can do this within motorist research design and we find pretty similar findings. Um, we can also do this uh, sergeant area kind of border RD uh, and again, uh, find quite similar findings. In the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into those in detail, um, but I'm happy to talk about that if there's interest. We also find, you know, if we use alternative outcomes uh, like arrest, rather than any contraband or the severity of the arrest charge, we'd find uh, quite similar results. So let me just, in the last uh, five to five minutes or so, I'm gonna talk about um, constructing counterfactuals. So just to take stock of what our findings imply for our original question, which was again, would equalizing search rates across racial groups reduce contraband yield? What we found here is that the between trooper SPCs are, are approximately linear with similar hit rates for white and black motorists and lower hit rates for Hispanic motorists. So on its face, this suggests it should be feasible for troopers to equalize search rates uh, while increasing overall contraband yield, if anything. Uh, and you can kind of um, see the reasoning for these statements from that, that figure I showed you <clears throat> before when we compare, basically this figure seems to be mostly consistent with, with the data for the between trooper SBC at least. Um, but there, there are gonna be some complications that arise for kind of reaching that conclusion. So we're gonna consider two policy counterfactuals where in both the goal is to reduce racial disparities in search rates. And we wanna simulate what are the consequences for, for counterfactual contraband yield. In the first uh, counterfactual, we're gonna ask what would happen if we reallocated troopers across patrol areas so that high search propensity troopers are put in low minority share areas. Second, we're gonna ask what would happen if we required troopers to equalize their search rates across motorist racial groups. And as I said, each of these counterfactuals is gonna have kind of a key complication. Um, so for the first, in order to do this, we need to specify, well, what would a trooper's outcomes look like if we were to do this reassignment? So who's to say if you searched, um, you know, 2% of the time in Houston, that if we reassigned you to San Antonio, you'd still search 2% of the time. That's basically the, the question. And then the second uh, issue for the second counterfactual is that's going to require that troopers actually change their own search behavior, like within a location. And for this exercise, what we really want is the within trooper SPC, not kind of pooled across troopers. So we'd like the within trooper SPC average across troopers. And in particular, if troopers vary in their ability to detect whether a motorist is carrying contraband, uh, these two SPCs may not be the same. So, you know, it could be that we have a linear between trooper SPC, but that's masking the fact that troopers that search at higher rates are just generally better at finding contraband. And in fact, each individual trooper's SPC is, is concave. Um, another complication that uh, I'm not gonna discuss here, but we talk about in the paper is deterrence effects. Um, so you might worry in these counterfactuals, we're, we're changing search rates for groups that might change contraband carrying behavior. Uh, we have a few pieces of evidence that we think uh, indicate that's not gonna be a first order concern here, but also happy to talk about that. So let me just walk through these reallocation exercises. First, let's talk about the, first, let's talk about the reallocation one and not the, the second counterfactual. Um, 
So the idea here is we're going to take troopers that search at high rates and assign them to areas with more black and Hispanic, or sorry, assign them to areas with fewer black and Hispanic motorists, and do the opposite for troopers that search at low rates. And that exercise is, you know, pretty simple. We're just going to take each observed trooper location combination, order them by their search rate for white motorists. Then we're going to reallocate them, um, reallocate the top and bottom X percent of, of trooper location combinations for some value um, X. Uh, and so the, the, the issue that comes up here is we need to specify what a trooper search rate is gonna look like in a new location. And one kind of very simple assumption we can make is, oh, it's just gonna look exactly the same. If you search 2% of the time in one area, you're gonna search 2% of the time in another, um, at least by mo uh, motorist racial group. An alternative assumption we can make is that and you move to a new location, your search rates are going to be a weighted average of how much you're searching today versus typical search rates in your destination location. And the way we're going to come up with these weights is we can actually look at troopers that we see moving across locations. And in that case, what you see is um, there's basically a weight of about 80% on there on the trooper's own search rate and 20% on the location they end up in uh, that would explain, <clears throat> that would predict their search rate in a new location. So we can try using that weight as well. Um, and importantly, we're, we're assuming hit rates are, are, are fixed here. So we're not saying anything about how hit rates are gonna, are gonna vary across location for the same trooper. We're saying for a trooper, for a trooper in one location versus another, they're gonna have the same kind of hit rate um, no matter where they are. Uh, and so with this kind of reallocation, this is just summarizing what would happen if we uh, reallocated 20% versus 50% versus 100% of troopers by their, their, their um, uh, across locations by non-white share. So if we go all the way to 100%, say we can eliminate basically racial uh, the Hispanic white difference in, in search rates or come close to eliminating it if we use these kind of reweighted search rates and we can reduce the, the black white uh, disparity in search rate quite substantially as well. Um, let me just spend the last minute talking about the second counterfactual here. And that's where we want to ask what would happen if we basically said, okay, troopers need to equalize their search rates across motorist racial groups. Um, the key issue here is this, this, the fact that the between trooper SPC we've estimated may differ from the within trooper SPC. Um, and th those two are going to be equal under this skill uh, search propensity independence. So that is if troopers uh, screening ability is independent of their propensity to search. And, and we find, we document a few pieces of evidence consistent with this independence um, condition. So one thing we, we note here is that at least for the um, motorist characteristics that we can measure in our data, low and high search rate troopers are actually searching observably very similar motorists. You know, they're all kind of more likely to search black motorists are all more likely to search motorists that have certain types of criminal history. There's no kind of indication on observables that they're doing different things in deciding who to search. It's just that high search rate, troopers search more people. Um, a second thing we can do is we can look at how hit rates vary with trooper characteristics. So if you can think of these trooper characteristics as something that might be correlated with skill, say experience or how often you're, you're stopping people even, that turns out to be uncorrelated with hit rates, either conditional or unconditional on, on search rates. Um, again, consistent with this uh, skill search propensity independence. And the last thing we, we do is we, we actually, um, we can directly try and estimate within trooper SPCs, where what we do is we instrument for a trooper search rate in a given location with basically the leave out mean search rate of other, uh, uh, other troopers in that same location. And we can estimate a model like that with both trooper and motorist fixed effects. So you can basically ask conceptually for the same trooper and motorist, if that stop happens in one county versus another, um, where one county has a higher search rate than another, how does that relate to, to hit rates? Um, and we find kind of evidence consistent with, with linearity in this, um, this research design as well, which is kind of more... Um, parametric in some sense, but is also using exactly the kind of variation we want, which is just within trooper variation. Um, so with skill uh, search um, propensity independence, uh, I won't go through this, but basically you can get this result that equalizing search rates um, across groups 
is not going to, if anything, is going to increase contraband yield. Um, so to conclude, what we find is Black and, and Hispanic motors are substantially more likely to be searched. Those searches are more, uh, are, are equally or less likely to yield contraband. Um, we find this evidence consistent with linear SPCs, meaning in practice, this inframarginality concern doesn't seem to be that uh, uh, relevant here. Um, in principle, you know, this, this indicates that you could equalize search rates while equalizing, equalize search rates while increasing contraband yield. And one important caveat there is we're not saying anything about policy in terms of how you'd actually get troopers to equalize search rates. That obviously has a, a whole host of complications itself. So we're unfortunately silent on that, but um, I think that that's an important thing to consider for future research. And finally, just taking a step back and thinking about what does this imply about trooper behavior or trooper, um, trooper behavior, what we're finding indicates that troopers appear to have limited ability to screen motorists and determine who is more or less likely to carry contraband. And an important implication of that is that with this very limited screening, passing the outcome test, the Becker outcome test, actually no longer implies uh, this equity efficiency trade-off. Uh, so I'll stop there. Cool. Thanks so much, Conrad. That was that was a great, a great presentation and a super important paper. Um, so uh, we have twelve minutes or eleven minutes if we want the minute break uh, for questions. So if anybody has questions, just like usual, just raise your hand, um, or you can unmute yourself and um, ask away. Conrad, what if there's a different objective function for the police than arrest maximization? Yes. So. Um... So I think there are a couple of ways of thinking about that. So, I mean, one prime alternative would be uh, some notion of crime minimization, right? So that's essentially where deterrence effects are going to come into play. Um, so what you might worry about is that uh, under these counterfactuals we've constructed, you're changing search rates by group. If motorists are responding to their race-specific risk of being searched, in deciding whether to carry contraband or not, then our conclusions are gonna be <clears throat> incorrect because we're missing that element. Uh, in the paper, we, we say a little bit more about this. Uh, in practice, we don't think these deterrence, this deterrence effect is gonna be that um, important here. And one reason that's maybe not surprising is, you know, we're probably not thinking about drug couriers in this context. These are people who were stopped for speeding and then perhaps found the contraband. Um, so, uh, in some sense, uh, you know, uh, you might imagine this is not a, a population that's going to be particularly responsive to their, their risk of being searched given a stop. Um, but we find a couple of pieces of evidence suggested of, of pretty uh, small to no deterrence effects. So, one thing we look at is we have this surge uh, in 2014 at the in border counties in Texas, where a, a lot more kind of troopers were assigned to those areas for a brief period. You see a lot more stops during that period and hence a lot more searches, yet no change uh, in hit rates following that surge. And this is a pretty well-documented surge. So you might imagine that would be something people would respond to. Another thing we see is that um, you, you could imagine that if people knew that some locations have higher search rates than others, they could respond on that margin. So if I know Houston has a really high search rate, when I'm driving through Houston, I shouldn't be carrying any contraband when I do that. That would be one response you might anticipate. Um, versus within Houston, I don't really have much control over which trooper searches or stops me. So I can't, it's harder to respond to variation in trooper search rates within a location. Um, so you might imagine that actually the, the, the SPC slope you would get would look different if you looked within location versus between location, if there were a deterrence effect. And in fact, we find that they, they look essentially the same. So um, at the extreme, you know, you'd expect there to be some deterrence effects at some level. Like if you just said, we're never going to search Hispanic motorists, um, if that was public knowledge, you might expect that's going to change contraband carrying behavior. But at least within this the range- sounds like the lapper curve, we keep going. <laughs> sure. Um, <laughs> But yeah, at least within the range of uh, you know variation we see, which is relatively substantial and is consistent with the range of variation we're considering in these counterfactuals, these deterrence effects don't seem that important. Um, I don't know if there are other objectives you had in mind. Well, that, I, th I think that, that that would be the natural one, and I yeah. guess 
I had a qu uh, second question, if I can uh, uh, it, it, it continue, <laughs> irrigate time. And that's the, what, what, what can biased officers do to circumvent whatever uh, rules are put in place to, uh, to measure uh, whether they're acting fairly? I thought you made some, so what you gave one example, which was misreporting. Um, and this is not really unique to your paper. I, it seems to me there's a general issue of the ability to, uh, this is something that uh, Navarro and I wrote about, that, that biased police can uh, manipulate the distribution of types uh, because they'll have more information than whatever gets reported and, uh, and kind of look unbiased when they're in fact uh, deliberately uh, I, over, over, uh, over, over stopping and over searching uh, people with very low probabilities. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's an important question. I think in the interest of time, I'm going to give you an, an unsatisfying answer, which is that I think our goal here is very, is limited in the sense that we're punting on this real policy question of um, how would you actually kind of constrain policing behavior in some way that would actually accomplish this equalization of search rates. And more, I think the conclusion we want to draw is, you know, some make the argument that these racial disparities in search rates are kind of a, an implication of efficient policing. And they're not arguing it's an implication of, you know, police preferences for searching particular groups. And so what we're finding indicates it's not, it is not an, a necessary implication of, of efficient policing that you in principle could achieve the same amount of contraband yield. Fair, fair enough. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, it's fair. As I said, it's outside the domain of the paper, but it's just, yeah, a it's a great question. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, uh, Ryan and then Matt and then Andrew, if we have time. I guess I have a, a somewhat related question, um, which is about the data set. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering how the uh, the the stops get uh, come into this data set. I'm not super familiar with it, and you and I'm sure you already talked about this in the beginning, but I, I think I kind of uh, I missed that because one can obviously have the worry that if the search rate, if the denominator of the search rate is important, and if, if there's an incentive for police to not report stops of non-white people because they don't want to look like they're pulling over a lot of non-white people, the search rate would mechanically go up. Um, and I'm so I just wanted to know if you could talk a little bit about that and potentially also if it has any uh, implications for the, uh, the, the SPC curves. Yeah, it's a good question. So I, I, I think, couple of notes about the data. So one useful thing to know, I think, is that, uh, so in principle, this should include every stop, including stops that don't lead to a citation. So that's, that's important for us. Um, so that includes just warnings. Um, I don't actually know in much detail what kind of monitoring there is uh, for, you know, whether stops are actually recorded. Now there are GPS coordinates in these data. And so in principle, uh, it would seem there could be monitoring. Uh, the technology is there to monitor, you know, whether stops are actually recorded because in principle, you know, they could see whether someone's stopping. I don't know how that's actually used. I think what I, what I, I would be concerned about, um, you might be concerned about racial misclassifications that are kind of strategic and we can, there are ways we can kind of tackle that with auxiliary data sets that suggest with what we have, that's not a first order issue because um, we have alternative measures of, of racial identity. I suspect that you wouldn't have much incentive to not record a stop at all because I would suspect that is like one measure of productivity. So you might have incentive to record a stop and then misrecord race and then your supervisor might just go with whatever you recorded for race, but we can actually go and measure something. We can get another signal for truth uh, that might be useful from our perspective. Thanks. Yeah, I suppose it's not just a non non recording of it, but it's also related to just differences in stop behavior uh, more generally, right? Because that could also explain why the data looks the way it does. Yeah. Uh, so you might. I mean, one thing you might worry about is is like which contraband is actually recorded correctly. We can look at arrests, which in principle you would expect to be recorded. You know, what a arrest actually reflects, there's some judgment there, but um, 
So we get similar outcomes if we look at arrests where that's coming from the criminal history data. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it's always kind of tricky with data recorded by the police to know exactly what to put confident, what, what you have confidence in, what you don't. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks for your talk. It was super interesting. Um, so yeah, I guess I was, so I, I was interested in your counterfactual, counterfactual exercise of reassigning uh, troopers uh, in order to achieve some you know, equity goal. So I was wondering uh, in the original assignment mechanism to what extent uh, the troopers sort of preferences are taken into account. Uh, in other words, is there potentially endogenous sorting um, by the, the troopers uh, as to which areas they'd like to patrol potentially based on racist preferences? Um, and then what implications would that have for your counterfactual exercise? That's a good question. We haven't explored that directly, but one, I think, suggestive piece of evidence of, of that kind of sorting perhaps is if you so one thing we can do is we can kind of correlate, we can look across locations and correlate, say, racial disparities in search rates with local characteristics. And if you think, um, so, so one thing we know we find is that uh, more conservative locations as measured by 2016 Republican vote shares have larger racial disparities in search rates. And we, we could do more to try and tease apart whether that's like a location effect versus the troopers that end up in those locations. Um, and we could think about doing that because we can see troopers in multiple places. Um, but in principle, yeah, I think that would be consistent with, with some kind of sorting on that margin. But it could also just be, oh, your sergeant in that area has different um, preferences or something like that. Thank you. I, I had a question, if we have time, just about the, so do you have a measure of the attempted searches or do you have a measure of the searches that were carried out? Because you mentioned that a large proportion of the searches are consent searches, so presumably there's some subset of consent searches where they're refused. And I was wondering if you have any sense of that, like how common that is. Yeah, that's a that's a good question, and it's something that people mostly ignore in this literature uh, because so we don't have data on it. So what what we see is the actual searches that happen. I think I've seen like there's there might be some jurisdictions where they have they record like attempted searches, but that I wouldn't I'm not sure I would trust whether that's recorded well. Um, but yeah, it's a good question that we punt on entirely. You can kind of just like think of that as baked into variation across troopers and their search rates. Maybe some troopers are just really good at persuading people or just like coming up with probable cause. Um, but that is there is like a two sided aspect to that that we're kind of punting on. Cool. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks so much, Conrad. That was that was great.